Our innate stress response system has been shaped through millions of years of evolution. It helps us to handle both everyday situations and extreme challenges. But in some cases, negative life events can lead an individual to develop a psychiatric disorder. The most typical of these stress-related disorders is post-traumatic stress disorder, which we will focus on in this video. But it can also lead to an increased risk of developing depression, anxiety, personality disorders, substance abuse or even psychosis. So let's start broadly. A stress reaction appears when you detect something that could be a potentially threatening stimulus. It could be a snake in the grass or a thrilling scene in a movie. The detection of a stressor causes a strain on your systems. And we will tell you more about that in a short while. But it also leads to a balancing effect with adaptive processes referred to as allostasis. They are recruited to try and restore the homeostasis in the body and also to take control over the situation. Imagine that you are in a traffic queue and get a phone call that makes you very stressed. Your child is in the emergency care unit following a traffic accident. The locus aureus, which is a nucleus in the brainstem, is the first to become activated. This happens in a second and leads to release of norepinephrine in the brain. Shortly thereafter, dopamine is also released. Together, they sharpen the attention and ability to react. Within seconds, the sympathetic nervous system also becomes activated, leading to increased blood and energy to the large muscles, while other functions, such as digestion, are down-prioritized. Together, this makes you quickly prepare to act with a fight-or-flight reaction. Following these first waves of primitive response cell, uh, the adrenal glands re release corticosteroids, which begin to travel up to the brain. There are receptors for glucocorticoids throughout the brain, but mainly in the amygdala, hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. The effect of these glucocorticoids leads to more long-acting balancing effects, aiming to further optimize the stress response. This includes cognitive changes, such as diminished attention of the stressor and of the mental worrying. Instead, improved executive functioning and a better working memory capacity. And this also helps to activate goal-directed behaviors that can solve the situation that has occurred. So the person in the car that got a stressful message over the phone starts to calm down and can reason on how to handle the situation. Depending on the cognitive reappraisal of the situation, the stress can either continue or subside. Some individuals face stressful situations that override their capacity to handle. Memories of those situations continue to haunt them for months or even years. In this video we will focus on post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. PTSD might develop following an event that is perceived to infringe heavily on the personal integrity or is life-threatening towards the patient herself or someone close to her. Some examples include being exposed to robbery, rape, abuse, natural disaster or war. It can also include severe psychological abuse. Risk factors to develop PTSD include previous exposure to trauma, psychiatric comorbidity, hereditary factors for PTSD, or female gender. Resilience factors that might protect an individual from developing PTSD include early prevention and treatment after a psychotrauma, strong social support, low stress sensitivity in the HPA axis, no previous psychiatric symptoms and good coping strategies. Recent research has proposed a framework for understanding the neurobiology of PTSD. It includes the following key components. Fear conditioning, dysregulated stress reactions, memory reconsolidation, epigenetics and genetic factors. We begin by looking at the fear conditioning. 
Fear conditioning becomes interesting for PTSD, considering one of the disorder's core symptoms is avoidance of events that could remind the person of the trauma. This strongly resembles an effect of conditioning where the trauma makes previously neutral stimuli suddenly perceived as threatful because they are linked to the trauma. For example, someone that has PTSD from a car crash can react strongly to film scenes including car chase. This can remind the person of the past trauma and initiate the onset of painful stress reactions. In PTSD patients, there also seems to be a dysregulation of the HPA axis, leading to hyperreactive stress responses. This can be seen as disturbances in the limbic system, structural and functional impairments in networks involving amygdala, hippocampus, medial prefrontal and insular cortex. Not least amygdala seem to be hyperreactive and has an increased tendency of generating fight and flight reactions. Next factor is memory reconsolidation. Patients with PTSD suffer from re-experiencing of the traumatic event. This is when the individual relives the traumatic event through flashbacks, nightmares or distressing inner images. In the video on cognition, we described how memory is transferred from short-term memory into long-term memory if the event is assessed as something important for the individual to remember. This process is disturbed for these kinds of very traumatic memories that lie behind the PTSD. And they never seem to really leave the active working memory completely. Next theme to consider for the neurobiology of PTSD is epigenetics. Several studies have indicated that trauma in early life, such as childhood neglect, can act on the stress sy system and lead to an impaired regulation of the HPA axis. This can then impact on how an individual responds to stressors later in life, for instance with a prolonged stress, stress reaction and an increased risk for PTSD. Finally, genetic factors. PTSD seems to be moderately heritable, around 40 to 50 percent. This shows some individuals are more sensitive to PTSD than others. There are mixed findings regarding which specific risk genes that are involved, but some candidates are such that influence neuroplasticity and uh, stress response. In this video, we have provided a brief introduction to the biology of PTSD. So hopefully you can apply what you have learned here when in the next video you will meet a virtual patient with this condition.